Let's take a look at the Pathfinder Adventure card game set, the newly rebooted entry point to this long running card game. We would like to start by thanking Paizo for providing us with a review copy of this core set. The Pathfinder Adventure card game core set was designed by Mike Selinker with help from Chad Brown, Keith Richmond, Avia Schertzen, and Liz Spann. Features artwork from Jay Epperson. This was published last year, 2019, by Paizo, and it's a follow-up and reboot to their already popular Pathfinder Adventure card game series, uh, which has been out for quite a long time. Now, this particular box set is designed for one to four players and includes a short adventure path called the Dragon's Demand. Now, the Pathfinder Adventure card game is a cooperative campaign-based card game played out over a number of separate adventures each which takes about an hour, an hour and a half, at least once you've finally uh, figured out all the rules and you're used to how the game plays. Now, as a campaign game, uh, players will choose characters that they are going to involve and improve on throughout the campaign. It is meant to be played in order, uh, though the existing box set does have a way to keep playing once you finish. For a look at what you get inside the new core set, you can check out our unboxing video on YouTube, a link to which you can find in the show notes. All right, so I have a few things I want to cover in regards to components here on the podcast for this game. Uh, for one, Paizo made a big change here with the box insert based on previous installments of the Pathfinder Adventure card game. Because all the previous ones, you would buy the, the base set and then there would be a number of adventure path modules you would buy to continue the story and the base box was a larger box and included a molded plastic insert these had not only a spot for everything in that set but spots for all of the further adventures path and expansion content all the characters all the extra spells and all the different chapters of the campaign so what you ended up with was this very well organized space for everything that was part of that adventure path so if you were going to play say the skull and shackles adventure path you would buy the base set and then all the adventures for it and it would all fit in your nice skull and shackles box for some reason they threw this out the window i i have no idea why now you have a pretty much standard three column card game box the same kind you see from marvel legendary and dc deck builder with nothing but dividers and foam blocks to separate your cards now while cost effective i can't say that's a welcome change at all yeah. as i've been strongly disappointed in my choice to go with the dc multiverse box as the holder for this very reason i don't know why they did this um i to be honest i haven't seen a lot of longtime fans complaining but me doing the research when i got this game and looking up how to play videos and stuff i'm like why doesn't my box have that like that just looks so much cooler um other than that disappointment everything else is great um i love the fact there were was a quick start guide one of those read me first right that tells you how to use what's in the box and fair warning do that. Read it before you use anything in the box. Uh, as you'll find, see in the unboxing video, I chose to open a random pack of cards, and that was not the proper one to start with. <laughs> so the quick start guide does warn you that first play, you only need this stuff. Um, there are some really rather thick rules. Uh, storybook with the first adventure pass, some standees, um, stands for the standees, some counters, set of blue dice. Um, interestingly, not a full RPG set. There's no D20 used in this game. So you don't get a full set of Pathfinder dice with this, but you do get a set of polyhedrals minus the D20. And well, lots of cards, lots and lots of cards, uh, 440 cards to be exact, even though they only take up about 10% of that box. Now that we have an idea of what you get, and there's a lot, how about an overview of how this game plays? All right, so step one, you're about to play a Pathfinder game. The same thing you would do with the pen and paper RPG is you are going to sit down and make a character. Um, there are 18 pre-generated characters to choose from. Uh, these include many of the iconics from the Pathfinder lore. Anyone who plays Pathfinder knows what I'm talking about. They're named characters that have carried over in the Pathfinder lore since the beginning of it. So there are 18 iconics to choose from. You're going to find the character for the card you like. On that card, you are going to get a deck list. This is going to tell you how many cards of each card type you're going to select to build your deck to play. Uh, as an example, the character I chose to play is Fumbus, the Goblin Alchemist. My deck in Pathfinder the Adventure card game contains two weapons, two spells, one armor, six items, one ally, and three blessings. Now, 
what I like in that quick start guide is for people who've never played before, having to make this choice makes no sense. Like you don't know the game yet. How do you know what to pick or what's going to work together? So what they've done is they do give you a sample deck for four of the characters and the quick start adventure actually has you play those four characters to get to know the rules. I had moved away from those characters really way because there's a goblin alchemist who blows stuff up. Uh, now, could a new player still manage to build a deck that was just garbage? Or does this list on the character cards help avoid that? Well, the thing is, the list is going to give you a balanced deck, but you might pick things that don't work for your character class well. So you're like, I, I would have to grab one of the other ones to see what they start with. But Deanna is playing some type of spellcaster. So she has like six spell cards instead of six items. So you are very limited. So you're going to have at least the stuff your thing could use. But like you may grab a bunch of like my two weapons. I could have grabbed uh, a broadsword and an axe. And it ends up my character is actually way better at ranged attacks. So it is possible to build a not great character. But once you play the character, like once you play the game once, the, it, you'll see what works with that character. And you can tweak your deck between games, which a bit more about that later. Okay. All right, once each player has built their character, you're going to pick an adventure to play from the storybook. Now, in this case, you are expected to play them in order. There is a tutorial called the, the Rumble Road, if you haven't played the game before, uh, which I do recommend trying as someone who hasn't played the game before. Uh, there is a small reward, so it might be worth playing even if you have played before. And just to check, because from what I understand, there are some rule tweaks from the original edition of the game, so it might be a good way to figure those out. If you haven't, uh, if you want, you can skip past that and go to the first part of the adventure path, which is called Plans Gone Wrong. You are going to play through the adventure, and once you succeed, you then move on to the next one in the book and continue doing that until you finish the adventure path. Uh, the adventure path in the base book is called Dragon's Demand. Um, it interestingly includes a final scenario for generating random adventures. So even if you played through the entire thing, you actually have two options at that point. I see no reason you couldn't play through with a different character and it would be a very different experience. This isn't the kind that this is, this is a card game. This is not an RPG. You don't necessarily, you, you might know what villain cards you're going to face, but you don't know. It's not a story game. There's no, you don't, you haven't solved the mystery already, right? It's, it's not an exit game. It's not Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. You could easily replay through the story, but if you don't want to, it does give you a completely random adventure generation system in the back of the book, which I thought was cool. Right. And I find that actually really kind of important because if you look at how much Pathfinder Adventure card game content there is, it can to the, you know, you know, uninformed observer seem pretty money grabbish. Yeah. But if you don't need to have adventure paths and you can still keep playing, that's reassuring. So I don't, it, it, I think it's more, to be honest, fan demand than money grabbing. Like that's, that's what Pathfinder does. Pathfinder produces all of their content, Paizo, sorry, the, the company behind Pathfinder produces all of their content in a subscription format. So what happens is you would sign up for an adventure path and it would send you the base game. And then a month later, they would send you the first expansion pack. And then a month later, they would send you the next expansion pack and they would do that. That's how they did it for the Pathfinder adventure card game. Same as what they do for their role-playing game. So it's the same type of thing, right? So that's part of why there's so much is that what's actually demand. That's been their format since, well, this is the company that brought us Dragon and Dungeon Magazine. And they're used to putting out monthly content in Dungeon and Dragon and it kind of fits, right? Now this time they did deviate from that because this time you have the base box and it has a full adventure path. And so far there's just one other box with another adventure path in it. So it seems like they've moved away from that. And you'll notice since 2019, now there might be other things going on in the world that have delayed things there isn't the 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 glut of content that we saw for the previous editions but the way it was staggered out makes it look like there's more than there is so basically what they did is they put all the chapters into one book now whereas before you would get a box with a set of new cards for the first chapter and then a month later you get another box with another set of cards and another book and then well actually it wasn't even a book before before the the it was all cards now they've written a story in a book so it's a, it's a change in format well, for, so what I was seeing was you get a core set. So you get a, there's a, a $60 core box. Yeah. And then um, five or six, I think it is deck. Yeah. Packs the adventure pack as well. Adventure. Packs. Yes. And then We're, some of them have a character pack as well. Yeah. Some had it or a magic pack or an item yeah. pack that you could get, but those six separate boxes are now one box and one book. 
So it doesn't, it, it's still as much content. It's just not split up. So I don't know. Um, so getting back to actually how, yeah, how you play <laughs> instead of their, their marketing choices. Um, what's going to happen is you got your characters. You're, you've looked up your first adventure and every adventure is going to have you set up a number of location decks. The number of location decks is going to be equal to the player, number of players plus one. Um, I think in every case. Each location, similar to your player card, is going to have a list of cards that belong in its deck that you're going to randomize from all the cards you own based on the scenario level. So you start off at scenario level one. So you're going to take all your level one monsters, shuffle them together, and then put those in the deck for the location. And then you're going to go through all your level one barriers, shuffle them together and do it. When you get up to level two scenario, you're going to mix in your level one and two stuff. When you get to level three scenario, you're going to mix in level one, two, and three stuff. Now, for example, the trail location has a deck consisting of four monsters, two barriers, one item, one ally, and one blessing. A different location would have a different set of those. So you're not going to go to the trail location if you want to learn a spell, which kind of makes sense. What you're probably going to run into on a trail is barriers and monsters. Barriers are like traps or physical hazards. Uh, what you might find is an ally. You might find a lost item and, well, you might get blessed by the gods. So that's kind of how the theme ties into a location. The other thing you're going to do is you are going to pick out a number of Bane cards. These include dangers, a main villain, a boss, basically, and the boss's henchman. You're going to take the boss and the henchman. You're going to evenly split them over to the decks. So you've got one henchman or the villain in each of the location decks. Then you're going to shuffle the location decks. No one knows what's where. Now, the goal of a standard adventure is to find that villain. You're going to go through the various locations, trying to hunt down and defeat the villain before time runs out. A part of this is going to involve trying to find the henchman, because if you can defeat the henchman, you can close the location they're at. Now, close just means it's like locked up. That location is done. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Now, if you meet the villain ahead of time before the locations are closed and you defeat them, instead of being vanquished, they escape and run away and they end up at a different location. So that's an important part of the game is closing out locations, then find the boss fight and defeat them. Now, I did mention this before time runs out. This is represented by a deck of blessing cards called the clock. At the start of every turn, you're going to flip over a blessing card. If that deck ever runs out, you lose the game. We never actually had that happen, but we did get close. Now, the way this all works... It involves a lot of little details and little rules, and there's no way I can cover it here. Like the rule book for this game is 30 pages, two columns, small text. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is summarize this so it makes sense and gives you a good kind of overview of how it plays. Because we want to sleep sometime tonight, not put you to sleep with rules reading. <laughs> so on your turn, you're going to do the following things in this order. You can give another player at the same location as you a card. This way you can trade equipment, allies, spells, everything you got, including the stuff you put in your starting deck. It's not necessarily yours. It's just, hey, take my sword. Hey, here's a healing potion. Um, you can then move. You take your pawn and move it to a different location. You could then may explore the location. This involves flipping over the top card of the location and encountering it. I'll get to that important phase in a bit because that's the big chunk of the game. If you're at an empty location, so all the cards in the location have gone through, you've gone through that entire deck, you've discovered everything there, you can try to close the location. Every location card has a different way it's closed that's described on the card. I'm not going to get into the details of how to close each one because they're all different. Finally, at the end of your turn, you say, I'm done, I end my turn, which triggers some end of round stuff like drawing cards and so on. Now, encountering cards is the meat of the game, right? That whole, I explore my location. I flip a card over and encounter it. When you encounter a card, you're going to go through anything that says on encountered because some stuff happens right away. Traps, for example, tend to happen instantly. As soon as you encounter the card, something happens. You then get the ability to use any evasion abilities. To be honest, I haven't even seen these. I have to assume like the thief characters or some of the items or invisibility cloaks or something let you do this, but it's a way to avoid the card that was drawn. If not avoided, you then are going to attempt any checks listed on the card. Now, checks are done to either acquire beneficial cards. So when you draw a weapon, an army, or an ally, a spell, or an item, what it represents is that you, you've discovered a way to gain that thing, and you just have to make a skill check to be able to get it, whatever that represents in the story. So if you find a suit of armor around the trail, you're going to make a check to see if you can acquire that suit of armor. The other thing you'll be checking for is to avoid 
the negative effects of the bad cards, the monsters, the villains, the henchmen, the dangers, and the barriers. Now, checks are, are, are pretty much what you'd expect from a game based on Pathfinder, except it doesn't use a D20 here, is you're going to roll a number of dice based on your character abilities. And different characters have different size dice assigned to different stats and skills and attacks. These are all going to be modified by the cards that you have in your hand. Because remember, this is a, a, a card-based game. Things like weapons are going to give you attack dice. Items might give you bonus dice for checks against barriers. Or spells might give you chances to put out. And there's all kinds of interactions here. Blessings are, are religious things. Blessings from the gods. Those let you double your dice pool. Some cards, interestingly, can be used to play on other players. So it'll say, like, adds a D8 on your attack or a D4 on another attack at your location. So you can actually give bonus dice to other players. Um, I even had one item that was a crossbow that let me add bonus dice to people at other locations because I was, you know, whatever, I was across the area. So I had initially been feeling like this was in many ways similar to the Lord of the Rings card games in some ways, but the use of the dice as well as, as well as uh, the, the character uh, advancement uh, mm -hmm. part is a really sharp diversion from, from just the card based uh, system. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't say they're similar at all, except no, for no. they're both card games for playing yeah. out fantasy adventures. But that's about it. So once you got all your dice, you got a dice pool. You're going to roll them. You're going to add them together. If you beat the check number, you get the card, or you defeat the hazard. Um, when you defeat the hazard, you just return to the box. There's no reward for killing a monster. You just don't take the penalty. Cards gains this way. So like, if you you get that suit of armor, you can immediately use it. It goes into your hand. You can immediately use that card. Failed checks can result in a number of things. Um, may make you um, get nothing. So for most beneficial cards, like that suit of armor, when you fail the check, you just didn't get it. You just put that card in the box. The armor's gone until maybe you find it in your next adventure. Same thing for like the item, the ally, the spell, whatever it is you're trying to get is lost. Now, most monsters, barriers, and dangers tend to cause damage. Again, we're looking at a, a pen and paper style role-playing game feel here. Interestingly, you have no hit points in this game. Your health in this game is your cards. Taking damage involves discarding cards from your hand to your discard pile. And the number you discard is usually the difference between the total on your dice and the difficulty of the check. So you needed a nine, you rolled a six, you take three damage. Armor cards, some spells, some items can be used to mitigate this. So a suit, that suit of plate mail that we picked up earlier on the trail might say discard to prevent three damage. So instead you're losing one suit of armor instead of three cards from your hand. Healing is interesting because it's the opposite way. So a healing potion is going to let you get 1d4 cards from your discard shuffle back into your deck. So that's your, your deck and your discard is your health. If a character ever can't draw a card from the draw pile, they've discarded the last card in their deck and they can't draw, they're dead. Your, your character's gone. You can no longer be played, like ever. Like this isn't a, you can just retry the scenario. No, your character's dead. Permanent, permadeath in this game. Um, unless you saved up a hero point, which is something, one of the rewards you can get. If you saved up a hero point, you can spend a hero point to bring your character back to life. Other than that, boom, gone, dead. So this is, in some ways, aside from the permadeath aspect of, of this, uh, the first of our uh, sort of similarities to Gloomhaven here, where yeah. your deck is your life. Yeah, very true. Actually, I hadn't even thought of the two being similar because Gloomhaven's hand management is so different from this game. But yeah, definitely like that. And there's a, there's actually a number of similarities. I think I, I point yeah. out a few as we go along. All right. Sounds good. I look forward to it. So one of the most complicated parts about this game that takes a bit to get used to is your whole deck management, right? Your deck is your health. So once you use a card for a check, something's going to happen to that card. And it all depends on what card it is. And this is the part that's really hard to cover without getting into little details. Like some of them just say reveal. Your armor's like this. That plate mail can prevent one damage. All you have to do is show the card. Look, I have plate mail. Done. I prevented one damage. But then some of them also have additional effects. So the plate mail might also say, or prevent three damage by discarding it. And then other cards will um are, are what's called refreshed what refreshed means is the card goes in the bottom of your deck and most of the spells in the game work this way so you like cast a fireball the fireball is used up it goes to the bottom of your deck and you can't cast fireball again until it comes back up again very rpg like right now banished cards are removed from play so if you cast that fireball and it, it might be like a, a different spell might like invisibility or something might say it's banished um, what that usually happens is when the wizard or the warrior tries to cast fireball, 
in the game, technically the wizard's not trained in Arcana. If he uses a spell card, it's banished from the game. So you get a chance to use it. So I think that represents your spell scrolls. Um, there's also discarded cards that you use them once they're discarded. There's single use cards. There's also the ability called buried where you place the card under your character sheet. And what that means is you can't use the card again, that scenario, but you'll have it back next time. It's still in your deck. Uh, there's a, a big part of this game is managing your hand and your deck and making sure you don't run out of cards. And also cycling the cards you do have with that refresh ability so that you have what you need for each challenge on hand. Now, again, this is a card game. As is expected in all card-based games, this is exception-based. Everything I've been mentioned can and will be modified by other stuff. Your character abilities, the abilities on your cards, the text on the cards you encounter, the locations each have modifiers for any card drawn at that location. Um, the hour it is on the clock, when you flip up that blessing, it'll say, if this card is the hour, this effect, out. there's just all kinds of crazy interactions going on. An example of that is spells. Every spell in the game says, do this thing, then the card's banished. But if you're proficient, instead, discard this card. But if you make a skill check, you only have to refresh the card. And that's kind of how every card reads. Each location has special rules. Each blessing card has things that go off. There's times when it'll say, face the danger. Well, at the start of every adventure, you're going to put out a card called the danger. And then as you're going through the deck exploring, it'll say, ooh, you have to face the danger. So for example, it might be like, you fall into a trap, face the danger. And then depending on what scenario you're playing, the danger is different. This is a game all about cards interacting with other cards. So this continues until players find and defeat the villain, at least for a standard adventure. Because again, some of the adventures in the Dragon's Demand Adventure Path has special rules and other victory conditions. But a standard game is explore various locations until you find the henchmen and defeat them to close the locations, eventually find the boss monster and defeat it. I'm saying monster, but it could be an NPC or whatever. If you manage to complete the adventure, you get a reward as listed in the storybook. Now, this often includes getting some uh, either specific or random cards. Like it might be go find this item card and get it. Or it might be you find a random ally where you'll take all your allies in the game, shuffle them and draw one. Or it might just be you get a blessing. The other thing you may get, uh, especially once you get a couple adventures in, are hero points. This is how you level up your character in this game. Each character card has a number of check boxes that can be checked off by spending one hero point per each box. These are all over the card. Like you can improve your skills. You can improve your basic stats. You can improve your attack abilities. Uh, you can change the amount of cards you have in your deck. Like remember my, my goblin can only have six items. Well, I have a check box to make that so I can have seven items. Note by adding cards to your deck, you're also giving yourself more health. So that's also your way to get more hit points. Um, there are individual character abilities and there's even a whole thing with, I forget what they call them in Pathfinder, but prestige classes where you can kind of level up to a better version of the alchemist with my character by spending hero points. The other thing you can use them for is you can use them for rerolls while you're playing. Though I gotta say, I, I don't know who playing this game is gonna save hero points for rerolls <laughs> compared to leveling up your character. I, I don't see the logic in that. And then there's the ever important one I mentioned earlier where if you die, you could spend a hero point to bring your character back to life. So Deanna is the one playing this game cautiously. She got her first hero point and has saved that since. Uh, me, I've spent everyone I've got. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fate point or XP, that's a seriously hard decision to make. I mean, reroll, I don't think that's much of a... Yeah. I, I, I mean, maybe if you've got a ton later, like, you know, you're, you're however many adventures in and you've got more than yeah, you could maybe. ever use. But uh, up front, uh, fate point or XP, just I, I can see how that's a tough decision to, to make. I, don't, I went with XP. I, I now do more damage. Anytime I play a card that has the fire acid or, or fire or acid ability on it, I get to add an extra D6 to my pool. Come on. How many cards in my deck have fire or acid in them? That's all about the deck building, which leads me to the last thing you do. So after you finish your adventure, you got to build your deck again. You are always limited to having the exact number of every card as listed on your character card, like when you built your character. So again, I am limited to two weapons and six items and one armor, and I forget the rest of them off the top of my head. Um, so you're going to have to look at what cards you have. And what's interesting is while you were playing, you might have banished some of your cards. So you might have to build your deck, but you're going to also have the stuff you found. 
And it's kind of like you, you look at what you grabbed and, and, and you also get to share with anyone else who took part in the adventure. So like when we finish a game, Deanna and I always sit there and we're like, all right, where's the new stuff we found? And we make a pile of it. And it's like, all right, we found this ally. We found this armor. We found this weapon. That's a level three armor. We can't keep it. And that's another thing that's interesting too, is when you're playing, you shuffle in every card you own. So you can get higher level stuff coming out. You can use it when you find it that adventure, but you can't keep it unless you're of that level, which is an interesting thing. So you're going to sit there and go through what's in it. And what's weird is you also can always add zero level stuff to your deck. In every game, we found that we are actually doing that. Like, like there'll be stuff that we banished while we were playing. So it's like, well, now I'm going to have to get a new item out of the basic stuff. Kind of like, think of it going shopping, right? Like you used up your arrows or whatever. You got to go buy more. You've used which up is, your magic arrows. Interesting so you got to go buy some, some, you know, bog standard target arrows. Uh, yeah, the exactly. Store before exactly. you go back out again. So it, it's interesting. So what you, you're going to sit there and rebuild your deck. And what's really weird is i found a lot of the games you end up almost the same like like you you almost just rebuild your character to what you started with which again is very rpg like yeah i guess not surprisingly this is where i'm starting to see a lot of uh parallels and differences between uh this and a game like gloomhaven well mm -hmm. pathfinder of course is an entire world of adventure and paths yeah. as opposed to the set dungeons in the local area of gloomhaven uh, where when you get into card management, well, again, there are there are differences here because you're you know when you burn a card in Gloomhaven, you're going to get it back at the end of the turn. Yes. Whereas if you bury a card, you're it's done and gone. It's and gone. You're never going to see that again. But within that, there are some real similarities in that that fine tuning your deck so that mm -hmm. when you go out to to take on that next dungeon or that next path, you've got the best cards you think you can have. Yeah to make the difference. Now, the one thing that Pathfinder has that we wish Gloomhaven has is trading between people. <laughs> yes. Um, the one Jaws missing, of the Lion does. The one, the one missing feature from Gloomhaven. Yeah. Jaws of the Lion you can trade, not yeah. the original. Another interesting aspect of it too is that cycling through your deck, right? Being able to refresh your cards. So you get this thing where Deanna will be at a location and she'll run into a wall of fire. Well, I'm I'm the I'm I'm the artificer, right? I'm the alchemist. I have all the items. She has all the spells, right? So then it's a matter of me trying to cycle through my deck so that I get my acid and I get my water bomb in my hand so that I can move over to her location to help her get past that goal. There's a lot of that that's going on here, which is a really neat thing that you don't see in most of these games. But again, feels Gloomhaven-ish with the the characters helping each other out, right? So as, as we get into final thoughts in the game, now that we basically kind of know how to play. <laughs> Again, this one's a rough one with all the interactions. Uh, this one took me a long time to get to this review. I feel bad. Uh, Paizo sent me this quite some time ago. It's taking me longer than usual to actually get to the review portion of this and get enough gameplays in. And this, this sat on my pile of obligation pretty much longer than any other game. And that's the learning curve. Like that rule book is one of the most intimidating I've ever seen. Like I like short of 18 XX and an advanced squad leader, like this, this is a scary book. Like it's, it's not only just the thickness, it's, it's how small the font is and how it's written. Like uh, Mike Selinker obviously writes role-playing games and not board games. Like there is a, a very different style of writing used to impart knowledge in a role-playing game compared to a board game and board game it's it's much more instructional whereas rpgs almost are technical manuals right like that's kind of the feel of it and i think the reason for this especially being this 2019 this new release of a game that's been out since i think 2013 i don't know it's been out for a long time there's been a, a, a large number of iterations different box sets for this out is that this game is also part of a public play network there is a pathfinder adventure card game society where people can go to local game stores and take part and take part in national tournaments and win prizes and get cards in this way the pathfinder adventure card game is similar to magic the gathering and just like magic the gathering the rules have evolved to be almost feel like legal documents right with the the, the amount of detail for exceptions and timing and specific card interactions and what parts of the card take precedence over other parts it's it, it's it's uh, an intimidating rough read. And now so, I will say, uh, August twenty thirteen was the 2013. initial so I was right with Rise of the Rune Lords base set. 
So yeah, 2013, this game's got it, some legs, right? Some teeth, long teeth. So as I said, though, all that said, sorry, all that said, like, it's worth the effort. It's it's worth getting through that rule book and sitting down to play. What I do recommend is don't do it. I do and reread the rules 80 times trying to internalize it. Just sit down and start playing. Um, those first few games are going to be rough. Like we, we were to the point of almost frustration of our, every time we flipped a new card, it felt like we had to look something up. Like it was that bad. I was like, all right, we got it. We got, we got this. All right. Flip this. Oh, wait, what's that mean? Okay. Thankfully the rule book has a really good um, index in the back. So that, that part's thankful. Um, I, I is certain the first game we spent more time looking up rules than actually playing. And I'll say even now playing through a big chunk of dragons demand, we still have to look up a few things every game. I don't think we've had a game yet where we didn't touch the rule book. Now, what is impressive that in all this time, we have found the answer to every single question we've had in the rule book. There hasn't been a situation we haven't had an answer to. Like I've never had to grab my phone and Google. I've never had to go to board game geek. It's all there somewhere. Yeah. And this is such a welcome change from all too many games where the players at the table will be all on their phone, Googling and finding different answers yes. often to the question that has arisen. Uh, there just aren't that many games out there that the rule book is that in you know complete yeah which is why it's as thick as it is right like i get it it I said, especially with organized play like you're you're looking at tournaments where people show up and there there are prizes on the line they got to make sure that everything's covered i get why it's there but it's it's a rough read it's it's a rough it takes a bit to sink in and like i said we're still to this day i'm sure if we go downstairs tonight and play a game there'll be something that i'll be like wait a minute all right the monster has acid resistance but I have a thing that ignores resistance, but only if you play a fire card and you played your fire card, was that on the same, you know, one of those trying to figure out how it works. And I'm sure it'll be there. Skipping all that to actual gameplay. Once you kind of got it down, we've really been enjoying this game. Now, when I first heard about this game, I thought it was a deck builder. Like I, I was thinking it was, you know, like not exactly, but Dominion Ascension, that aspect of it, that I'm going to have my deck of cards that represents my character. I'm going to go through an adventure and now my deck's going to be bigger and better. And then I'm going to go through another adventure and my deck's going to be bigger and better. That's not what this is. This is, this is um, more like Magic the Gathering. This is more deck construction. You build your deck at the start of it, each adventure, and then you go through it. And yeah, you might gain a few cards during play, but it's not that common. Like, it's not like you get uh, a resource to buy more cards. There's no central market. There's no thing you can always buy for cost two or a goblin you can always kill to get some XP. It's not like that. Your deck starts off tuned. And by making some jacks during play, you may gain a few cards, but those may not even fit with your deck. Like, that's the other aspect of the game that comes up. Like, I'm playing a goblin artificer when that plate mail comes up. I don't want that plate mail. I'm not proficient in plate mail. I'm going to put that on, and it's just going to take up room in my deck. Meanwhile, my scale mail gives me a nice plus two when I'm trying to hide, right? At the end of the venture, you always clean up your deck. You don't get to keep all the cards you gained, which is different than a deck building game. Most of the time we found, as I mentioned earlier, what you started off with is pretty close to what you end with. There's maybe one or two little tweaks. And another way the game's very different from a deck building game is the feel. Because one of the things you're going to do in a deck building game, and especially by culling your deck, you want to cycle through your deck as much as you can. In this game, if you run out of cards in your draw pile, you die. There's no reshuffle. Now, have you had any of those, oh, I need to shuffle moments? I mean, especially, uh, you know, with, with Gloomhaven and things where you're used to, <laughs> you know, that, that shuffling through your draw pile. Did you get any of those moments where it was like, oh, oh, no, I'm not allowed to do that. This card is discarded. I don't, we never had the problem, but man, the last time we played, we talked about this, I think the last episode where I played extreme, I left four cards in the box, which now that you know how the game plays, oh, you yeah. can see how bad that is. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, oh, I don't want to have to draw a card. And I'm at the point where I'm like, I can't use my gear to use this fight because if I use my gear, I'll have to discard it, which would cause me to draw and I have nothing to draw. And it's like, I would love to be able to use my bomb right now, but if I use my bomb, I die. So if I die, D might still win the adventure, but it's permadeath. So I'm like, no, nope, sorry, I'm not using my bomb. Or I've had turns where I'm like, I'm not exploring. I am not going to explore. You go explore. You do your thing. I'm because you can always discard your cards for free, right. which again, is dangerous because if you discard, that's your health gone. But when I know I have a healing spell somewhere in my deck, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to throw away this armor for now and hope I draw my healing potion. You go explore over there. I'm busy over here. Right. Now, another thing that's 
uh, a big change from deck building games is that most of the cards here have multiple uses. Um, so I kind of mentioned this again with spells, how, how they refresh. But another example is weapons. So, for example, an axe might give you a D8 to attack. And you can just use that over and over every round. You don't you don't have to start it. You just have to show, look, I have an axe. I get a D8 to attack. Look, I still have an axe, right? It's a role-playing game. I've got an axe. But that same axe might say, refresh to assist an ally at a distant location. So you know what? It, thematically, I can throw my axe. But if I throw my axe, I no longer have it. Because now it's at the bottom of my deck and I got to wait till it comes back. It just It's a really neat way to, to represent that type of mechanic. What all this leads to is a really neat puzzle. Like I, I would honestly say this is a puzzle game. I, I love that feeling of flipping over a card at a location during explorer action, looking at what's there, and then trying to figure out how best to use my cards to overcome it. Then there's the fact the other players are working with you, right? Do you have a blessing card? Oh, do you have anything that'll help on a distant obstacle check? Oh, I got a locked chest. Do you happen to have anything to use that? Do you have an ally you can give me next turn so I can get it in my hand to try to get through the woods because I could use your tracker? All of that happens. And I really like that. And I also like the way the the the, the cooperation builds from this because that's something I find missing in a lot of other cooperative board games, that ability to trade items and use your items to affect other players. I don't think I've ever played another game where I can spend my card to help you on your turn. Although, you know, you say that, and now here, I'm going to go back into uh, these Gloomhaven comparisons because, you know, anyone who sits and watches your Friday night streams knows that you're using your action to move D2 spots so that she can attack in yeah. that thing, or you're making sure that you infuse dark so that on her, her turn, D can use whatever she has and and there is that level of comparison there is some the difference yeah. the difference is you're not actually trading actual cards or items right. and of course the the gloomhaven uh communication restrictions well, yes. are a big are a big uh sort of hindrance mm -hmm. um and and limitation to that cooperation but also again you know gloomhaven is again a more condensed world and opening up that cooperation would almost just make it too easy yeah. Um, and you don't have the expanded universe mm -hmm. to work within. And, and that's why uh, Isaac, I think, has in, invoked some of those restrictions on yeah. characters that don't exist in Pathfinder. But I think the puzzle-solving similarities yeah. uh, are in many ways really quite similar. Yeah, I, I, the more you talk about the more I'm starting to agree. <laughs> There's definitely differences. They, they feel very. I think it's just the feel, right? Like well, again, I don't feel like I'm playing level of, similar that games. That level of cooperation yeah. um, and, and the free moving information and items is yeah. a massive difference. But again, it, it's because of that, you know, the the restricted environment in Gloomhaven mm -hmm. versus the unrestricted world yep. of Pathfinder. Yeah, and to be honest, what the game actually recommends is play with your cards face up. Oh, wow. in this case like you're allowed to share any information so why not yeah and all our first it's not few like games you don't know what you, the person standing next to you is holding exactly <laughs> although if they're at a distant location that'd be an interesting metagame if you're at a distant location Flip you have to over. have your cards yeah. in your hand it's a cool way to do it all right i do have a complaint about the pathfinder adventure card game uh it's something worse than the learning curve and this isn't mainly because this isn't going to go away uh, the, the learning curve, once you've learned to play the game, isn't a problem anymore. Uh, the size of font they use on these cards. Like these cards, uh, for anyone who's seen the unboxing video, seen this, or you can Google it and look at the cards in this game, they have the most text I have ever seen put on a single playing card size card. Like there is a ridiculous amount. There are full paragraphs of text, not one paragraph, multiple paragraphs of text squeezed onto these cards. And to get it all to fit, they used a small font, a font that drives me nuts. Like uh, just. The other thing, too, is the amount of text on every card means you're probably not going to memorize those. Like, there's a lot of text on most Magic the Gathering cards, but eventually you're going to wreck you like, oh, that's a whatever, a Sengir Vampire. I know what that does. And you're going to learn it. There's 440 cards in here, each with three paragraphs of text. Like, I, I'm sure, like over time, you're probably going to learn the cards in your deck and maybe some of the cards in your opponent's deck, but there's just too much to memorize. We're at the point now where to play this game, we have a magnifying glass at the table. Like, this is beyond me taking my glasses off. This is, I need something to make the cards bigger. Yeah. Well, we're old, eyes fail, and sadly, short of skimping on card art, 
I doubt that there's anything I, they could really do about it. I guess. I don't know. Maybe tarot size cards, but then I guess the game would cost more. I just well, your box size old. would get uh, <laughs> yeah, four hundred and forty tarot cards in a is a big box to deal That's with. That's true. That is a big box. That'd be a tall box. I would still be smart and gloomy. Even. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Overall, I, I think you probably tell. I I'm extremely impressed by this game. Uh, this was my first experience. I did not play the original game. I didn't start playing it in 2013. Um, despite a significant learning curve, like it, it's definitely there. This is not a quick, easy to read. Let's sit down, get the game, crack it out tonight. We're going to play tonight. Oh no, you're, you're going to have to spend at least a day or two reading ahead of time. And then you got to teach your friends and then keep that rule book handy. Um, I've enjoyed every play we've had, uh, even when we failed. Like this is, this is a game that's like pandemic when you fail and it's close. It's like, Oh, we're so close. Let's try again. Um, the adventure path has been fun. Uh, it's been entertaining. The story is pretty good. They've done some really neat stuff using the mechanics that I don't want to spoil, but just like interesting ways to represent like NPCs traveling with you and stuff. They've done some cool stuff. Um, card game really does give you some of the feel of playing through a pathfinder adventure but you don't have to have a game master, a full role-playing group, and uh, no one needs to do any prep and you don't have to draw maps and you're not uh, all the stuff that has to have to happen to play a role-playing session. You don't need all that. You can get that experience with just this box set. If you're a fan of Pathfinder, I, I think there's a lot to like in this card game. No, it's not going to feel like playing through a full role-playing game adventure path, but it does let you experience the Pathfinder world in another way. If you dig adventure games in general, I think you're going to find a lot to like here. This is a very different take on fantasy adventuring than saying a dungeon crawling game, like especially a descent, but even a gloomhaven, there's no positioning here. There's no map. There's no hexes. There's no line of sight. You don't get that aspect of the game at all. This is all about managing your items and trying to mitigate the dice, trying to make sure that you have a nice dice in your pool, that your odds are good. You're going to succeed. And what's interesting is you're looking at dice pools here. So you're not looking at the usual linear curve that you see in most role-playing games. You're not just rolling one D 20, you're rolling two D six and a bonus D four and a D eight and doubling the D eight because of a blessing. Like it's a, it's a much different system and you can do the odds in your head a lot better for anyone checking this game out though. Realize it's not a deck building game. This is not a clank or anything like that, right? This is not a game where you're just going to keep improving your deck and your deck's going to get huge and by the end of the game and have this massive awesome deck. It's not like that. It's, it's, it's much more of a slower progression, more like a role-playing game. This is a campaign game where deck improvements are going to happen between adventures mainly. Sure, you're going to find a couple things, but you may not even want them, like a role-playing adventure. You may not find the gear you want, but now and then you find that sweet magic sword that just makes your character better from that point going forward. What I do strongly suggest which I wish I had, was someone else to teach me the game. So if you can find that, that's your added bonus. This is not the easiest game to learn uh, from reading the rule book. It's like reading a technical manual. But if you can't find a teacher, I do think it's worth the effort. Excellent. Um, now, here's one thing I wasn't clear on when I was looking through this. Are the paths from earlier, so if, if I... You, uh, uh, compatible. So if I buy the 2019 box set, am I going to get something out of buying a path that came out in 2018? So they did change the way things work significantly for the adventure pass. So the previous adventure pass were a one large oversized card and it had a list of what you encountered on encounter one. And it just basically told you how to build the decks, how, what villains to use, what whatever. And you would check it off when you beat it. And then there'd be part two, part three, part four with rewards. That's been replaced by a like a mod, a D and D module, like a book. It's it's a right. small book, but it's a book that tells here's your story and here's what's happening. And there's more to it. There's more involved. So yes, the old ones are still playable, but you're not going to get the same experience as you will with the new one. Right. And I. I think you'd have to enjoy this a lot to want to go backwards, in my opinion. Like it, everything I've seen. Now, again, I haven't played the old sets, but I did. I've watched some how to play videos. Interestingly, there is not a single how to play video for the new set out there on anywhere on the web, which I thought was odd. There's lots of the old set, and watching it, there are differences. There are rule changes. There's sections of this rule book that tell you what's different, so you can do it. And the old stuff is all compatible, but there are little tweaks and little differences. Uh, blessings work completely different. The clock's completely different. You no longer have an adventure path card. Like, they don't exist at all. You now, again, have a book. 
it, it it's I think there's enough here. Plus, there is another full adventure path already out, which I have, yep. which if we ever finish Dragon's <laughs> Demand, we're also going to review. There's an unboxing video of you if you want to just see how many cards are in there, because there's not really a lot to unbox. There's a book and a bunch of cards. Um, I don't see why you go backwards personally, but you if, if you really love this game and you're really enjoying it, there is more content out there. I think one of my favorite pieces of content that I found showing just how much love players have for this game <laughs> is the player mats, which are oh, yeah. basically fancy mouse pads, really. I mean, they aren't, mm -hmm. these aren't fan really super fancy, but they actually come with a rule. Whereas if you are using your uh, player mat, your pro the proper player mat, you get an extra um, refresh of a card. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> just, just because you've, you made you know, your up and, and bought your bought the player mats that's pretty cool that is one thing that is not compatible so this is important there was a board you could buy for the first edition and there was a mat you could buy and i've seen it at cons that's not completely compatible anymore hmm. because of the way they changed because location cards used to be larger as well okay so like it has a spot to put your campaign card your, your adventure path card and a spot to put your location cards and then the other decks go below it making basically like a big snowflake the game no longer plays like that. Now you just have a bunch of set decks in front of you. All of the cards are standard playing card size now. There are no oversized cards. Like they kind of changed that. Like you could get the map, but it's gonna have a bunch of squares on it you won't use, which is kind of the opposite of what you want to play map for. Right. No, absolutely. Yeah, and will, they have put will one out for mats, the so I'm not sure. And they are so still and they are still sh shown on the Paizo website, which is where I found them. So I'm thinking those are probably individual player mats, yeah. As opposed to this is like your central board, right. your your central the the locations, right? So again, you're gonna have number of players plus one locations every game. So playing two player, we always have three locations up. Right. And if you have more players, you would build a bigger circle. All right. Well, for a somewhat more in-depth look at the Pathfinder <laughs> Adventure Card Game Core Set. 2019 edition, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews.